let's hit it. And welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. What you think about. Welcome back to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm thrilled that you're able to join us today. For those of you that liked our opening song, it's called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band, and you can download that on any of your favorite music platforms. For those of you that are new to our show, Alzheimer Speaks is about sound information, not just sound bites. We like to talk to real people that are in the trenches with this disease all around the world. And so we talk with people diagnosed with family and friends, business professionals in the industry, researchers, movie directors, singers, songwriters, authors, children, everyone is welcome on Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. And so if you think you've got a story to share, please reach out to me at radio at alzheimerspeaks.com. I'm really excited to have this guest with us today, and you will see why shortly, but I always like to do a few shout outs. So first, I want to shout out to Maple Hill Senior Living and Moments Hospice. On September 15th, I will be doing a program for them uh, that is Dementia Around the World, Perception, Stigma, Services, and Movements. That is free. It'll be from 8 to 9 a.m. on September 15th, and that'll be virtual. You can just reach out to me for more information on that. Also, Brookdale North Oaks here in Minnesota, we do a caregiver support group the last Wednesday of each month from 10 to 11 a.m. Central, and right now that is in person. And then also Arthur's Senior Living, we do a memory cafe the second and fourth Wednesday of each month from um, one o'clock again, central time, that's virtual. And, and again, anyone can attend. Also the Brain Donor Project, check that out at braindonorproject.org. They need brains, both healthy and diseased in order to move research forward. And then of course, there is Dementia Map, a new initiative that was launched Um, just this last fall. And it really is about everything dementia. We have about 150 categories. We're just growing it organically, but there's lots of great information on there and more coming on every single day. So if you're a business and you want in on that, again, feel free to go to DementiaMap.com or reach out to me. If you are a person looking for services, products, and tools, and a lot of free information, check out DementiaMap.com. If you'd like a a personal tour, I'd be glad to give you that um, as well. There you'll find information on memory cafe directories, businesses like Coral Health that's giving away two of their apps free to download Music First and Coral Faith. Uh, You will find the foot bar walker. You will learn about Saltbox TV and Xenia TV. So many books with all's authors, so much more. We're going to go ahead and hear from the foot bar walker, and then we'll be right back with our guest. Introducing the life-changing foot bar walker. I'm Peggy from Danville, Kentucky, and I'm 91 years old. The foot bar walker revolutionized my care of George. It absolutely benefits the patient and the caregiver both, and that's the beauty of it. It's so easy to use. It folds up just like a dream. I got it in and out of the car without any effort at all. The saving that I made from having to put him in a nursing home came to about $192,000. The 
someone you love use a walker? Do they struggle to get up from a seated position? Are you a caregiver dealing with physical pain and stress as you help your patient? The Foot Bar Walker was designed to assist not only the patient, but also the caregiver. Patients have more control standing up, and no lifting from the caregiver is required. See how it works at thefootbarwalker.com. That's thefootbarwalker.com. Peggy, would you recommend the Foot Bar Walker? Do I ever? I would not be in the health that I'm in today at this age had it not been for the Foot Bar Walker. Well, as I said, I am so excited about our guest today. Uh, this is a man who has really been in the trenches uh, with the disease, and his story is really powerful. His name is Pat Moffat, and he wrote and produced the award winning film called ice cream in the cupboard, which is a true story of his caring journey with his late wife with early onset Alzheimer's. Pat is dedicated to supporting caregivers and providing education about early onset Alzheimer's. So Pat, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. I'm glad we're able to get after those cancellations and COVID things. And I can't believe we're finally pulling this off. I know, I know. It's It's been a rough uh, rough time out here you know it's uh um, it's teaching us all to be spontaneous and kind of let go of yeah. control a little bit which uh yeah. is another True. thing dementia teaches us <laughs> True, <yeah. laughs> why don't you tell people a little bit about how you were touched i mentioned that your your wife had it but you know how did that impact you personally and and your family and friends well it, it was uh something that was so uh, destructive um, and, and it, you know, it, it isolates the caregiver along uh, with the patient, especially early onset, because everybody's like, don't know what to say. Don't know what, should I go over? Should I call him? What should I do? You know, mm -hmm. and you wind up getting really not much action at all. So it, it's kind of a lonely existence. And, uh, you know, my Carmen was diagnosed at uh, 53 years old. Wow. And so I, I, which I thought was, oh my God, this must be a record of some sort. You know, not have. I was 49 years old at the time, and uh, I said this must be some sort of a record. And then when her sister was stricken with it, while Carmen had it, and then the brother and another sister. I mean, this is four out of four siblings, and this is a very rare mutation, and uh, it, it it just created so many problems with the family because everybody wanted to do something different. I think you should take this medication. I think you should follow that. Well, I'm not giving my wife that. I'm not giving my husband that. So it, it was kind of all kinds of problems that have started and separated the family quite a bit. Oh, gosh. You know, with with the four out of four siblings, how about your children? Are they worried about? Yes, very. And, uh, but one of them is actually a physician. Uh, Laura, she's one of the twin girls. And uh, I've discussed this. You know, they're, they're common. They're my stepdaughters. And uh, I've discussed this in Manhattan at the Alzheimer's Association and all, and uh, met with some doctors. And the answer is on, on there, uh, what would happen? What's the chances of them getting it? And the chances are 100%. Uh, but whether they would get it at 90 or 60, science doesn't really tell us that. So I spoke to Laura, who's uh, the doctor, and, and I said, you know, would, would you wanna go get a test and, you know, for the AP04 gene and so on? And she said, Dad, why do I really want to know when the next shoe is going to drop or if it's guaranteed? You know, yeah. so I'd rather not know it all and live my life. But I pretty much know I have it. Yeah, well, and, you know, I, I have heard from more doctors, you know, when, I, when I've asked that question um, myself, and they said, you know, it's kind of like the cancer gene. Everybody probably has it. Is it going to mutate? Yeah, exactly. You don't know. Yeah. And uh, I've had a couple of friends who have done just kind of the DNA testing that's out there. And um, they've been surprised because it's come back and they didn't have any genetic um, counseling to support that. And so that really threw them for a loop in terms of what does this mean? And, you know, the thing is, no one really knows what exactly it means in terms of pinpointing things. And uh, so, yeah, it's... Uh, it's a devastating thing. You mentioned karma um, getting diagnosed at 53. My mom started having symptoms at uh, 55 and oh, she lived so and she lived till 86. And wow. so long journey, long, long journey, you know, with that. But I always tell people that her disease was probably the biggest gift of my life. 
because uh, it just taught me so many beautiful life lessons. Not that they weren't hard, yeah. <laughs> but there right. was there were some beautiful things wrapped in a really strange package. Is yeah. How, I, yeah. how I say that. What was your inspiration for creating the film Ice Cream in the Cupboard? Well, the, the uh, as we just you know discussed it, you know, getting this at fifty three. Um, Common being diagnosed like that, uh, I thought immediately that this was some sort of world record for mm -hmm. you know, because the last thing I was connecting in my mind was Alzheimer's. It's just not even a thought at 49 years old and 53, because uh, I was sitting around like much of America as uh, they are right now still, saying, "Oh yeah, you get that around 80 or 90. I'm not going to worry about it right now." <laughs> you know? And and so that was uh, that was a hard hitting part. And um, she was such a lovely person and very, very calm. And she turned out to be extremely violent with this. And so being a caregiver for Carmen, and, and then I found out all these, all the other caregivers that were dealing with this, uh, I wasn't alone at all. Uh, but I had to get this story out about such a terrific person uh, that completely turned into a violent individual, just directly the opposite. And, and so that, that was the inspiration for how to get it done. And, and then when the brother and two sisters also got, I said, well, you know, am I, am I reaching out enough with a book? And I really happened to bump into someone on an airplane going on a business trip to LA that happened to be a uh, producer. And so we, you know, it was an author and we exchanged books. And uh, he called me like four or five days later and said, I just read this twice. And he said, this is a movie. I mean, you know, it, it, I didn't know anything about this. And this is for real. You know, so it was it was quite the thing. So I got a good shot, and I said, "Now I got, now I have the awareness level that I really want. I've got the media that I'm, I'm really looking for to do this." So that was what was behind that. Wow, you know, I hear a lot of people wanting to kind of make their life stories into a movie, but financing always comes, you know, in the way of things. How did that go for you in terms of of getting things funded? Well, I, I actually did it all myself. I had uh, one one small uh, investor, but I have the, the really the whole uh, ball of wax of this thing. I uh, used my four hundred one k. I refinanced the house, so there's I'm still have a lot of debt, which would probably never level off. But as long as my message gets out, I'll, I'll live with that part. You know, so I, I think we'll be fine. We are kindred souls. You know, I stepped into this in uh, two thousand and nine, and. I was just a frustrated daughter. You know, my mom lived till uh, 2014. And I just thought, there, we have to be able to do better. You know, there's got to be a better way. There's more people than just my family. And there's got to be a lot more resources out there. And we have to get people comfortable having this conversation. So like you, I took my life savings, my retirement and everything and said, yeah. that's, that's on. Um, I, I'm going to do my damnedest to try to make a difference, um, big or small, whatever it might be. But, you know, we've got to get people believing, I think, in the power of one, that their stories matter, um, that they're not alone. And as much as we can feel out of control and like we don't know anything, we're 10 steps ahead of somebody else that we can help. And, you know, making that kind of chain link, you know, one link at a time is, I think, a really, really powerful, powerful piece of the pie. I had a group called um, something that I, I invented with two social workers here on Long Island, and it's called Let's Do Dinner. Mm -hmm. And the Let's Do Dinner was really for uh, early onset caregivers. Uh, and I would take everybody out to dinner, usually 15 to 20 at my expense, have the two social workers with me. And it got everybody into an environment, a private room in a restaurant, and it got everybody into a getting to know each other and discussing each other's cases. And that went so far. These people just got so much out of that. They couldn't wait till the next dinner. And of course, when we have Facebook and things like that, they all become friends. And you know, they become their own social network. They become their own support group using a platform. Well, one night, about 24 people were there. And I went, oh, my goodness, that means to me. I'll, as many want to come, I'll buy dinner. But that means to me it's a lot more patience as well. When I hear I got 24 caregivers, when I choose around 15 or 16. And a, a woman, uh, we had a kind of a little dais, and, and a woman that was sitting uh, just to my right, uh, we, we thought that we'd go around the room because we had so many new people that night. And just say who you are, 
um, what what uh, your patient, your loved one, what do they have, what type of dementia it might be, and so on. And um, this woman started off and she said, well, I see I'm in with the right group of people. I'm only 51 years old and, um, and I'm, I'm right with the right group here. And I didn't even know a support group like this even existed. She says, well, my real purpose for coming here is to want to thank Pat Moffitt for saving my life. Lori, the tears ran down my face. It was stunning. I had no idea. This is the first time we saw her. And the two social workers looked at me and it was like, what I didn't know what to say. What I do? <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, you know, I, I uh, and she said, and let, let me explain that. She says, first of all, I drove forty miles to get here because it doesn't exist in the other county. And she said, what happened was I was ready to pack it in. I was ready to pack in life. I, I was planning to end my life. My husband is my best friend. All my life we were together, twenty five years, and now he's in nursing care. And he doesn't even know who I am. And I've just had it with life. And I picked up ice cream in the cupboard. And I read what Pat Moffat went through. My husband was basically a calm guy. And Pat got hit with just about everything on top of that. And it, I just said to myself, you know what? If he can do that, I can do this. I'm sticking around. I'm not quitting. Wow. And I was just completely stunned at this. I was so happy that the book had reached someone like that. You know, and there is a kind of a, another pump inspiration that I gotta keep this going. I'm getting somewhere and I'm reaching people. Yeah, the ripple effect when you share your story is so much more massive than we can even imagine. You know, I'm, I'm a girl from Minnesota. I didn't travel much and you know, I started my blog and all of a sudden I'm connecting with people around the world and I'm going, what happened here, you know? and and. <laughs> Finding that this is an issue all over at all ages and stages and um, the struggles. And yet, you know, I would hear these creative ideas, um, but people a lot of times were afraid to test them out. Like you just said, hey, I'm going to do this. You know, I, yeah. I said, hey, I'm going to do this. But there's a lot of people <laughs> out there that don't necessarily have that gumption <laughs> and that confidence yes, yeah, yeah. to go start it. But as they start talking with others, they get that, hey, I can do this. I can I can be part. I can make a difference, um, not only in my own life, but in others' lives. And that is so powerful. I think especially in the disconnected world that we live in, you know, people need yes. a purpose. We need that sense of community back that we've lost. And um, like I said earlier, dementia is a really strange package, but there's a lot of gifts in there and a lot of, a lot of life lessons. But what a beautiful story to be able to hear something like that. I mean, it's just, um, I, those moments are incredible. You know, I, I've, I've had them myself. I went to um, Arizona one time to speak and a man came up to me and he carved me a, a purple angel, which is the global purple angel for okay. dementia out of wood. And I was just like, oh my gosh. And he's like, you've been so helpful with helping us get set up here and making a difference and creating a dementia friendly community. And, you know, I, I was just talking with people, you know, I just yeah. sharing ideas and, and stuff. And I still have that up in my office. I'll never get rid of that. That just oh, yeah. was one of those things that just touches your soul. And, exactly. and those are just the ones we know about, you know, there's yeah. so many of those things. And with your, you know, your book, your film, I mean, it's, uh, it is just an incredible, incredible story. I want to talk out first with talking about some of the first signs that you saw in Carmen, because a lot of times people don't recognize them uh, because it's not always a memory issue. It can be right. some other things as well. So if you wouldn't mind sharing, <laughs> that'd be helpful. Which is exactly uh, my situation as well when it did take place back in 1998. Uh, my wife and I were uh, just bickering a ton. And I know husband and wife will bicker every now and then. That's the way life is. But this was just out of control. I couldn't walk 10 feet without me doing something wrong and getting yelled at for. It. And I said, you know, maybe, maybe we were just both working too hard. Mm -hmm. um, I know what we'll do. Let's go down to Puerto Rico. My wife, Carmen, was Puerto Rican. I said, we'll just have a nice romantic three days. We'll get away from everybody, get away from the phones, the business all that stuff. And uh, she was okay with that. 
And on the flight on the way down, she was just very quiet, not saying too much at all. And we got down to the hotel and checked in. And by that time, it was almost time for dinner. And um, so we went to a, a beautiful restaurant in Puerto Rico called the Chart House. It's no longer there. And I was, we ordered steak and lobster. And uh, I said, well, what? I can't get any better than this, you know. And, and I was admiring the cars going by, 55 Chevy, 52 Pontiac. Wow, they have some cool cars down here. And as I turned back to look at her, she picked up the entire plate of steak and lobster and threw it in my face. Oh, wow. That somersaulted me practically out of the table. I hit the table, my head at the table behind me, and she ran out of the restaurant. So I was just covered with stuff. They were picking me up off the floor, scared the living daylights out of the family behind us. And by that time, she was already two blocks away. So I had to start running after her, and I caught up to her, and she still was agitated and yelling at me. And then the, the police came, the Puerto Rican, what they call the tourist police, saw something wrong here. What's a six foot three Irish guy chasing a five foot Puerto Rican woman down the middle of the street? You know, there's something wrong here. So I got her kind of calmed down and I was able to get to the police saying, you know, I, we just had a you know a little bit of spat. And, uh, I'm, I'm, I have no idea what I'm saying at this point. Yeah, I'm making excuses for something I don't even understand. But uh, they accepted. I said, OK, have a good night, sir. We got back to the hotel and she laid down in the bed and uh, I went out on the terrace. And I drank three of the fastest beers, I think, in my life. I was shaking. I had no idea what the experience was coming from. And then I started thinking, well, we were separated a number of years ago. Maybe that's what she wants to go back to. Maybe this time it's divorce. And this is the way she's going to create trouble. And uh, she walked down on the terrace about 20 minutes later and said, honey, I am starved. What are we going to eat? You have to feed me, you know. And I said, I tried that. Yeah, I just don't think you tried it. We haven't been anywhere. I haven't left the room. And I said, no, we went to a restaurant. I tried to feed you and you threw the food at me. That's why I'm covered with A1 sauce, cocktail sauce, all kinds of stuff. She said, I don't know why you would say something like that. I love you. I wouldn't do something. I didn't want, one of you ever seen me violent. And I just didn't even know what to say. So uh, I, I said, I, I just have to back off, shut this thing down. I called the airline, got a ticket for the next morning the next flight out, and we were going back to New York at that point in time. And I still had no idea what I was dealing with. So that was the story. So and then once we got back, she kept telling me, which I know a lot of caregivers here from the stricken person or the loved one, there's something wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with me. I don't know why you keep telling me there's something wrong with me. I don't do the things you're telling me I do. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, she refused to go to a doctor. And that was a real problem. So I had made a decision that I said, if I have tomorrow, you know, after a few weeks went by, I said, tomorrow, if I have to tie her up and put her in a car, I got to get her to see a doctor. And I called her physician, uh, OBGYN, that kind of, those kind of folks, looking for answers. And I got, well, maybe it's a short of, you know, a vitamin B12, it, it could be that. And it could be menopause, but she's too young for that. Maybe that doesn't fit in. Because all those things had a little bit of forgetfulness and, and that to it, and certainly some irritation on, on uh, menopause and so on. None of this was working. And um, just when I was planning this, what am I going to do tomorrow? She came home that night and she said, um, I mean, I'd like to talk to you for a minute. And I said, sure, what's, what's the matter? And she said, I have a touch of Alzheimer's. And I said, a touch. I said, isn't this like being almost pregnant? I don't think there's, you got it or not, you have it. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, you know, she was trying to ease that blow on her husband, mm -hmm. uh, even at that point in time, knowing what a difficult disease she just heard she had. And so what was happening at the school where she worked at the elementary school, several blocks away, the bus passes for the children were all wrong. The kids are on wrong buses. Oh, geez. She was supposed to do the school budget. She skipped it all together. They asked her, when is the, bu is the budget ready? What budget? I don't do budgets. And then people, uh, parents were calling and saying, listen, don't put my daughter on the bus today because I'm coming to pick her up. We have to do some errands. Well, of course, they were talking to Carmen. When the phone got hung up, the call never existed. Child goes on the bus, nobody home, winds up knocking on a neighbor's door. Police are called. No one knows where the mom is, you know, kind uh -huh. of thing. And then it was all zeroing back to Carmen's desk. 
So the school system actually told the principal, said, listen, Corman, you either have to go to the local hospital. You know, we made an appointment for you. And if there's something wrong, we'll find out what it is. We'll work on it. Uh, but if you have to at least retire, you'll have state disability. But if you refuse to take this exam, we have to let you go for cause. And so she decided that being in that box, she, she went and was diagnosed really right away. Wow. That's how I heard about it. Wow. That's a, uh, that's some big things. I know my mom, you know, she, she, and my dad had a doctor that they went to for 40 years and mm-hmm. he didn't know anything about dementia, not a clue. And it, so for 10 years, he kept saying, it's just menopause. It's just your hormones. And my mom yeah. would say, this ain't my girlfriend's hormones. We talk about this stuff. This is totally different. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it was just, it was really sad because we lost a lot of time. And then, you know, my dad ended up getting brain cancer and then we're like, we're seeing, you know, kind of the decline and the change. And we, then we, we had to force the issue of going in for a full, you know, two half day battery tests. And back then, this is really sad to say they mailed out the um, diagnosis didn't even meet with us three months later and said, Oh, she's got the mentality of a three year old. Don't let her out of your sight. And we're like, well, what do we do with that? You know, now they've retired up at the lake at the end of a peninsula and they're two and a half hours away from family. And um, I mean, it was just, it was really something, but we didn't have with, with my mom and every, everybody's dementia is different. We didn't have the significant, um, behavioral changes. My mom was always really social. She's pretty happy go lucky. I would say the biggest change in her was she got quiet because she didn't want to make a mistake. She didn't want to embarrass herself or anybody else. Um, But she didn't get, um, you know, there were a few moments where she got kind of mean and, and paranoid where like she wouldn't, uh, we'd go up to the lake and, and the only one she'd allow in the kitchen was me. So I would be cooking and cleaning the whole time. Everyone's out on the lake, having a good time, (laughs) but you know, she wouldn't let my sister-in-laws or my brother or anybody in the kitchen. And so it was like, okay, that's what we're going to do to keep it calm. And that was probably the worst of what we had, but you know, in the film, you know, it, it showed where she, it looked like she shredded your clothes with a, with a knife or a scissors. Yeah. With a razor, yes, yeah. yeah. And that yeah. really happened. Yeah. That really happened. And the, the telephone call uh, that I was, uh, Dana uh, Ashbrook, that's doing it at the time, that telephone call actually came into my office and she was actually in the car with my stepdaughter and my stepdaughter had called me and said, you need to get out of the house. You need to get home from work, get your clothes and get out. She's banging her head into the window with a car inside with a knife in her lap. Oh, wow. She said, Dad, I don't don't know what to do. You just need to run until we figure this out. You know, and um, a police car pulled up next to my daughter in the car and said, you have a problem here? And she said, no, my mom and dad just had an argument. You know, I hadn't even seen Carmen that day. Uh Something snapped inside. And she thought of something out of the past or whatever. And so I came home from work, packed my clothes, went to a hotel. You know, I thought, what am I doing? You know, what is, what is going on? And, and uh, fortunately, the, the police never saw the knife in a lap, but there would have been an arrest of something going on. And, and so this was, uh, you know, she was constantly like this. And it was a very dangerous existence. And I yeah. think you may have seen the, the scene with the knife in the drawer. Yes. Yes, and you were sleeping and you're watching her and then you get up and go, then you started packing everything up. I I just, uh, oh my gosh. I I just- They they went a little crazy. Director went a little crazy with that one as far as locking everything up. I definitely put the knives away for sure. Uh I I actually was staring at her going, she wonder what she's doing. Yep. She she would have a tendency to put tissues everywhere. Oh, my mom too. strange things that they do, all these idiosyncratic things, but- um, that's why I said, oh, she's probably got another box of tissues in there. And I heard to close the drawer that I went in and there it was wrapped in a nightie. Was oh. a huge knife. And it had been a knife that I actually brought back from Vietnam. And, you know, I don't I thought I had put it in the garage somewhere. I have no idea how it got into her hand with the drawer. 
But that's the night that was in her lap when the police pulled up next. Oh time. my gosh. Now I'm saying, oh, what's going to do next? You know, what are we going to do? And, and then that life just got much, much worse after that, uh, especially the more violent acts that occur. After we got the diagnosis, we realized what we're dealing with, and we were on, I think, Aricept, which is what is it, Donzabil now, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, that didn't seem to have much of an effect on her. Uh, but I had a housekeeper, and uh, she beat up the housekeeper. Oh, my goodness. So the housekeeper came to me and said, listen, Robert, I, I, I love working for you. and But, you know, Miss Carmen, is, she's just too violent. She's pushing me around. I'm so frightened when you're not here. So she quit. So I got a, a professional caregiver. Nice woman. And it was something that I, I didn't pay attention to, but I, I, people say I, I would have never thought about this. A woman that was uh, recommended by a professional group, organization, and uh, so this woman's very familiar on how to deal with Alzheimer's patients. So, you know, we think she'd be perfect for common. I said, okay, great. And she, woman came in, she was quite heavy set, quite out of, out of sorts as far as her condition was. And um, uh, she brought in games and cards and things that she could play with common, which was impressive to me because the woman had a plan. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was pretty cool. I went, oh, good. Now I, I feel much better. Now I can go to work. And I know she just won't be staring at a television. She'll be doing something. This woman knows what she's doing. And a couple of days later, I was on my way home from work. I left work early. And as I passed this construction crew, I saw my wife with a helmet on, talking to the construction crew, digging a hole in the ground, about three or four blocks from the house. Was that my wife? I pulled (laughs) over. And and, um, I I said, hi, guys. I said, "I'm, I'm her husband. And the construction guy said, thank God you're here. She seems like such a sweet woman. We just gave her a helmet because she insists on working for us. <laughs> we couldn't get her to go in there. We were just about to call the police because we were just out of ideas. And she's dressed so nice. Mm-hmm. You know? Well, with that, the caregiver comes flying around the corner. Well, 250, 300 pounds, or uh-huh. whatever it was, sweating, going, Mr. Robert, I'm so sorry. She got out of the door so fast. I just went to the bathroom. I didn't think it was going to be that long. And she bolted. <laughs> and so I think you, one of the bigger things you have to remember when you do get a caregiver for an early onset case that's in good condition, like Colin was, make sure that the guy that could keep up with her in a race. Oh, gosh. One of the things you just have to kind of remember. So. But then she quit because she was getting hit with everything. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that I, I in Long Island, we have an Alzheimer's daycare center at uh, uh, Northwell Health. Um, and so I got it there. It was very pricey, um, but it was something where I know I could go to work, drop her in the morning, bathe her, get her, have her breakfast, drop her off there. She'd be there the whole day. And it was a beautiful looking facility and they had all kinds of stuff they did during the day. And that lasted about three weeks. I'd pick her up after work at night. So I was able to keep my job. And I always tell other caregivers, try to keep your job. At yep. some point, you're going to really need it. Mm-hmm. And, and quitting may not be the best idea. In any case, um, they called me and they said, you really need to come out to the center today. We have a problem. I said, okay. And I got in my car and I drove 20 miles or so, whatever it was. And what had happened that day was that she beat up an 85-year-old man. Oh. Punched him in the face several times. And of course, at that age, you bruise so awful. It looked like he was had a, a gang on him, you know. And I said, they said, come and pushed him around and, and, and punched him and everything. And we had to notify the family of the man that was attacked mm-hmm. by him. And so we have to let you know that in the state of New York, um, you're, you and us are responsible for anything that happens where a violent patient attacks another. You're responsible for that person that did the attack. So they could take legal action against us and you. Oh, my gosh. The, the family has decided, understanding what Alzheimer's is, and flabbergasted that Carmen even had it compared to their dad or their own, like 85 to 53 or 54 at the time. You know. So they understood, and they didn't do anything. But they said, yeah, here's the deal. We can't take it here anymore. Yep. We're done. We can't have an incident like this. I said, well, what, what, is, what is my next step? They said, well... Nursing homes aren't going to take her because of the kind of case she is and because she's violent. And so they're going to have, she's going to have to be tested for antipsychotic drugs. I said, okay. And I said, we have a hospital nearby that's done just this kind of work. 
you'll have to leave it with us for about three weeks mm-hmm. because the, the testing and what we do with the to figure out the best cocktail of these drugs that there are 28 possibilities back then. Uh, we have to monitor to see what the reactions are 24-7. So there'll be a person even sitting at the end of the bed. And so about three weeks later, the two psychiatrists called me and two social workers came in. And they said, Mr. Moffitt, your wife's case is so difficult that we have to recommend that she goes directly from here to 24-7 care. She's a danger to herself and anyone she comes in contact with. The drugs that we were able to come up with we don't know how long they're even going to work in her case. And we don't know what other reactions she could have that's a week or two down the road. He said, that's, for instance, if she convulses in the middle of the night, you call 911, she'll probably die anyway. They won't know what to do with these drugs and how to handle it and uh, how to you to pass on this information to them. It's something that's not workable. So it's up to you in the end, they said. But then I knew what I had to do. People were getting hurt. The end of the line had come for me. And of course, then I arranged for 24-7 care after that. Wow. I mean, your story is incredible, but there are so many people living this life and and yet they don't know who to talk to. They think they're totally alone. Um, did you have her brain um, autopsied at the end by chance? Uh, yes, we did. Yeah. And, and did she have frontal temporal lobe or was it... No, they, they called it Alzheimer's at the time. Okay. And now I've spoke to other people since then. And they said, possibly if we had to do it again, we might have selected frontal term. Yeah, it, it sure sounds like it with the behavioral changes. And, and then, it leads itself more to FTD, right? Yep. Yep. I know we, we autopsied my mom and it came back Alzheimer's, um, Louis body and Parkinson's. And I met with the, the doctor and he, you know, he looked at the results and said, oh my gosh, I've never seen a brain this atrophied. And then he apologized because he was just, he was just literally was shocked. And he's like, but Lori, if she's living with it for 30 years, this is exactly what we should expect, yeah. Yeah. you know, for that kind of shrinking. And, he, you know, he wanted to ask me questions more about Louis body. And I said, we didn't really see the the hallucinations and the delusions and a lot of things associated with that. But, you know, we did find out um, or realize that, you know, she was having body temperature changes and things like that, which people don't, they don't think about those things being part of a, a, of a dementia. And then the, the Parkinson, she had a little bit of shaking, but then as she lost her ability to care for herself, she was in the wheelchair and she was doing lifts. And so that wasn't as noticeable. Um, The one time she had um, severe tremors, I mean, really severe they called me in to kind of go over the DNR paperwork one more time because they didn't think she was going to make it. And then like two or three days later, they just stopped. They just stopped on their own and she was bad. I mean, it's, it's the weirdest disease, you know, just very, very strange. One of the things I've been doing, if I, if I can go on here for a second. Sure. All the caregivers that I've been trying to help. And there's a a couple of cases I'm concerned about the caregiver with the early onset uh, loved one uh, for possibly that they might um, uh, be hurt in a, in a violent kind of incident. But the other real fact is they're more likely to be stricken with something themselves. Yeah. Because that their immune system is just run down to a point, trying to keep up with these uh, cases. And, uh, uh, and as I, I learned early on, uh, when Carmen was diagnosed, that this disease often can claim two people, the caregiver and the patient themselves. And I'm seeing cases now that, are, that I see them on Facebook, on the dementia groups on Facebook, uh, where a one woman in particular, and I'm, I'm going to meet with the police department here in a few days, but one woman in particular, um, uh, she got kicked in the chest by her husband. He was 51, early on, sir. Mm. And uh, uh, she called 911 police came and he said to them, you know, I am fine. There's nothing wrong with me. This woman's been smacking me around. I'm fine. And she's, and the woman explains to the police, no, you don't understand. He has early onset Alzheimer's. And the police goes, early onset, he's 51 or whatever he is. You know what? You're under arrest. They arrested the caregiver. 
right? She spent yep. the weekend in jail, $3,000 ah. for a lawyer, lost her job before she could explain the win. Police didn't understand what it was. Like many people today in, in our country and all over the world, what do you mean your wife got Alzheimer's at 53? And our case on Long Island, our youngest case in, in several years, died about two years ago. Uh, he got stricken at 32 and died at 43. Yeah. So these cases are out there, Lori. They're, it's just amazing. And, and there are dangerous lives that have been uh, really risked out there. So. Yeah. Well, and, you know, the younger uh, people are, and if they've got children at home, that's a whole nother risk value, right. you know, to, to put in there. And these kids need support too. And there really isn't support in the school systems Perfect. to help them or even support groups really for the kids as much as they need. There's so much education that needs to, needs to happen. I was on a panel in Puerto Rico a number of years ago. Uh, the Alzheimer's Society of Europe had a uh, different countries came and represented. It was very, very interesting on who had what kind of caregiving, Spain, Peru, all these other countries, yep. and meeting some great people. And uh, it, it was uh, just amazing. And I said to the local, I knew the local uh, Alzheimer's people, Alzheimer's group people were there. And I said, by the way, what's your youngest case here? And it says, well, we have two, Mr. Moffat. We have one at 28, a male, and one at 29, a female. And he said, she said, sorry to say that their children have already been taken away from them. And they haven't hit their 30th birthday. Uh, so, you know, I went, oh, my God, every time I go somewhere, what am I going to hear next? You know, yeah. it's just always something new with this disease, Lord. Yeah, I know one woman who two children she has. One's passed. I think he died when he was like 21. And the other one is um, late teens, early 20s now. And but fade and fast, and it, it's just so sad. This is this is a disease we have to talk about. Um, I used to be invited into the schools, and I, I haven't been doing that lately. But I, and I I started you know just speaking on general health and kind of ageism and things like that, and then kind of got into the the Alzheimer's and dementia. And it was shocking how many how many teenagers are taking care of a loved one, either a parent or a grandparent. And yet they are not really told what's going on. You know, they want to help, but the parents think that they're protecting the child, but the child, you know, sees that the whole family's upside down and that they're not the priority that they used to be. And so that kind of puts them in a tailspin of what did I do wrong? And yet I'm supposed to, and it's just, you know, we have to have these conversations and we have to have these supports because these kids have great ideas because they're just totally out of the box. You know, right, they're game right. to try anything. And, yeah. and that's what we need, in my opinion. You know, let's just let's try something new um, if it's not working. And, and not that we can't use the tools that we have. But, um, you know, I think we really need to get creative with this disease because we're learning new things all the time. And you know, there's hundreds of different types of dementias that are out there and there'll be more that are developed and, and many have multiple um, dementias or their diagnosis changes. Like uh, I'll never forget um, when they, when they, when uh, mild cognitive impairment came. And so all these people had Alzheimer's disease. And then all of a sudden the insurance decided to change the rating system and they had mild cognitive impairment. And, you know, all my friends said, there's nothing mild about this. Nothing has changed. You know, <laughs> nothing has changed with my diagnosis. They need better terms here, you know, and they were really, really frustrated. And yet yeah. people look and go, um, well, and probably even with your wife too. Well, they look fine. I mean, they're younger, they're, you know, they're social and, and until something really significant happens, what are you talking about, Pat? What are you talking about, Lori? Yeah. Looks fine. I mean, that, what you know, that one particular case with the police officer after it was all cleared up, and I've heard of these things before, uh, because they're not trained. Police officers are not trained on early onset. Yeah, they're, they're thinking just like everybody else is thinking, and just another human being that's not familiar with it. Yep. And uh, so I was like talking to a, a couple of social workers. I wish there was some kind of a maybe a seal or a mark, or a pad that we could put on a window or a front door. Mm-hmm. That would only be connected to, listen, there's an Alzheimer's patient living here mm-hmm. and maybe register them with the local police force. Okay. But with no, maybe just let them know that at this address, not necessarily with a name. So they have some advance notice. Yep. 
uh, but for other agencies as well. But um, that case in particular, I've heard several like that with police officers where they're just doing their job and haven't been trained and not familiar with this. So, Well, and people don't know this, but um, people can call into 911 non-emergency and they can register their loved one with the police. So if the police go out to the, the house, they'll have information um, readily available. Who's, who's the care partner? What name do they like to be called? You know, when we go for a walk, they usually go right or left, you know, in case they wandered off which way they should maybe head first. Um, they can take a whole description. There's a thing called the, the Care Alert Center where people can, it's a, it's a subscription. I want to say it's like $20, $25 a year, but you can have a, like a flyer all set up in case your loved one would go missing. And so the police don't have to get all those details. You can have a picture of them. You can even have a picture of your car in case you're worried they're going to take the car. Um, and, you know, it's just one of those things to have a little bit of relief because when you're in crisis, you're like, ah, how tall are they? And, you know, you know, what's going on? And, you know, you're just, you're crazed. And, and the system allows you to have, I want to say like 10 buddies. So it'll blast out to them. It goes out to the phone system while the police is, are doing their things. But I had a friend who, you know, had a loved one who wandered off and they didn't do anything. And this person happened to be um, schizophrenic and was in like a boarding house and they didn't take it seriously at all. And it was like six days later and I went with my friend and I said, I am driving you up to that police station and either they're going to get to the media or we are. I said, this is, excuse my language, bullshit, yeah. you know, but people, this, this still needs to be taken seriously. She was missing for months and showed up, you know, probably, a, I don't know, hundred miles away. Just, and no one busy. really, no one really knows what happened. And yeah. You know, and right along those lines, if I may, we had a, okay, March 3rd, I'll never forget the day of this year, uh, we had a, a ton of snow on the East Coast. I think we got about 16 inches on Long Island. And in Pennsylvania, they had a good 27, 28 inches that it fell heavily quickly. Wow. And a, uh, a woman early onset got up in her pajamas, got out of the house, got eight blocks from her house, completely disoriented, had no idea where she yep. was. Even if she did, the snow just messed up everything anyway, and just crawled in a snowbank and stayed there. She was reported missing by, I would guess, her caregiver, possibly her husband, at 4.20 in the morning. And they found her. She was already dead from hypothermia at 9.30 in the morning. Now, uh, I'm sure the husband, I mean, I'm, I'm venturing a little guess here because I know the feeling. Uh, maybe he had a few drinks. I know mm -hmm. I did. I used to try to relax because I couldn't sleep and I try to relax and maybe he did. Maybe he just went into a sound sleep of being exhausted yep. and thought in his mind, well, maybe she went up to go to the bathroom, but she's probably definitely not going to go out in the snow. Yep. And that's exactly what they're going to do it. And, you know, I, I called the, it was Allentown, Pennsylvania. And I called the Allentown Police Department and I, I told them who I was and uh, this incident, I said it was only four days, five days later. And I said, if you could put me in touch with the family, it would be very good because I can help them a little bit. I can't make this go away. Mm -hmm. But I know what to say to a family. I've lived through this. And that's why I, want, I put one of those scenes in the movie, Laurie, mm -hmm. when my wife is walking the dog for four hours in the rain. Yep. The same kind of a situation. The dog found the house. Yep. Right. That's the, who knows what. And, and you know, we couldn't do that in California. We made it rain, but it was actually an ice storm. On Long Island, that's where my wife and the dog, they were frozen. Oh. Her, her eyelids were just frozen. So I, I asked her if they could put her in touch. Don't give me their name. Ask them if they'd like to call me. Mm -hmm. Please in touch with me. I said, my name is Pat Moffat. You can Google me. I'm a movie producer. I wrote a book. My, I put this in my movie because it's a very similar case. And I can say some, some words that will comfort this family because I know how broken hearted they are at this moment. That caregiver is saying to himself, oh, my God. I had a glass of wine or I fell asleep. I was just so exhausted. And because yep. of that, I killed my wife. And you know what thing? I called three times. They never returned the call. Uh, so, you know, again, so I say, what is this guy talking about? You know, but it was clearly in Yahoo News. It's definitely dementia. It was definitely Alzheimer's. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, we're hearing more of those stories and training is really, really important. In fact, I'm going to be um, speaking to a group uh, next week, uh, you know, of police and uh, kind of talking about this whole issue. I, I don't know if you know, Pat, but I, I um, was involved with rolling out the first dementia friendly community in the U S um, with the, with the um, Lutheran home association and oh, yeah. uh the director there, you know, he always refers to me as as the the spark that started the fire, you know, because <laughs> I because I'm always clawing at new ways to to yeah. do things. But this is so critical, and I think we fall in this trap of everything has to be black and white and criteria based, and it's like we just have to start having this conversation and educating people in a informal, comfortable fashion. Because there's, there's so many different ways everything can play out, you know, and none of us are going to come with this, here's the perfect little toolbox, you know, to fix this, because everything yeah, is different. Right. And so, you know, we all need to learn um, from different voices, yours, mine, there's a zillion people, people living with the disease that are out there, you know, trying to change uh, minds, heart and souls. Uh, you know, uh, there, there can't be enough of us advocating you know, for change and education and, um, and removing the stigmas, you know, with this, because it's, it's the biases that we carry that can hurt our ability to care. Well, they can't have it, you know, they're too young, you know, and yeah. here you're learning the there's teenagers that have it young, you know, young adults, you know, once you're, once you're in this process that you, uh, I mean, the doors open and as care partners, like I always say, oh, you don't know what you don't know. I mean, that's as just simple as it gets. And, you know, reaching out to that family, you know, kudos to you, even though the connection wasn't made um, because you've lived it, you know, and people need that support. And we need to get other people to understand these connections are highly valuable. And no one's breaking any confidentiality if they're giving your information to them. Yeah. And, and, you know, it always seems to be, too, that uh, um, when you when you try to get uh, to, to a, a caregiver growing on to, um, the males are, the husbands or males are always more um, resistant to taking on extra care. Mm -hmm. I've been married to my wife for 25 years. Nobody knows my wife like I know her. Don't tell me I need help. I can handle this. I'm quitting my job, and I am going to get this handled. Boom. Worst thing you can do. Yeah. You know, and, and, and a case like that on I for my friend's brother it happened to, and I said, Rick, you need to stop him from doing he needs care in the house. Mm -hmm. She's only 49 years old and he needs some help. Yep. Three weeks later, he had a heart attack. Uh, he finally gave in and hired help, but a neighbor got to him in time. He got to the hospital, he was okay. But that was so atypical of what we, you and I know, yep. you know about these things. So yeah, it's well, and the pressure too, I think, from society is when you are the primary care partner, no matter if you're a husband, a wife, if you're a son or a daughter, a friend. I mean, that's a big responsibility. And I, I don't know about you, but I kind of felt like all eyes were on me. Yeah. Well, like, how's she going to do this? You know, what's going on? And so, I mean, you really kind of step it up and you, you know, and then what I found was I got so protective that I, I pushed my brothers away. And like I told them, I'm not taking all the responsibility because you could have had a conversation yeah. with me about <laughs> this. You know, you were quite happy for me to be taking this role on with mom and dad. Um, but again, I, sometimes we don't even realize that, you know, when someone asks, how is it going? You know, we usually go, it's just fine. We, we got this. And, we, and, and inside we're going, oh my God, if they only knew. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But a lot of times I think we think they wouldn't believe it because I could write a book on this, you know, what there you, you did, what you did do, <laughs> you know, this could be a movie. <laughs> yeah, I could do a movie on this. <laughs> exactly. So oh, with the movie itself, again, the title is Ice Cream in the Cupboard. What, what do you want people to take away from the film? Well, first of all, that, you know, I want them to take away the fact that you do get this at a young age, pay attention. Because when I think when everything gets started, the way I started to set up the movie with the director, you don't know really what's coming off. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh, it's a husband and wife thing. I wonder who's going to win the fight. Yeah. You know, and then I gradually roll into it. And so that, you know, getting them a little bit stung was what I was trying to do. That this, in fact, does happen at early ages. 
And these violent cases exist all the time. Not all of them, like your mom, but these cases are out there. So I'm trying to save some lives here. Mm -hmm. uh, indicative of the lady with the book, you know, that she saw something in it that, that helped her. I want people to come away with something. Yep. Say, wow, I learned so I didn't know this. You know, and that'll help them help somebody else along the way. And you know, getting that done, Lori, I don't care about funds or anything else. You know, I, I won the game already. Mm -hmm. you know, I got the message out there. And and so I, I accomplished what I set out to do. It's a wonderful, wonderful movie. And I really encourage people to to uh, check it out. Again, you can go to the website, ice cream in the cupboard.com. Um, or you can go to Pat's website, his personal website, Pat Moffett, M O F F E T T dot com. He's also on Twitter at Ice Cream Movie, um, Instagram at Ice Cream in the Cupboard, and uh, same with Facebook. And then his email is Pat Moffett Author at gmail dot com. Again, just a, a brilliant story. Uh, I, I applaud you for being brave and sharing this because I know for some people, they're going to be really taken back at, you know, what this process can look like. And, and yet the only way we're going to make change is if we have honest, authentic conversations about the reality of, of this disease and the impact and the ripple effect that it has not only on the family, but the community at large and um, how important it is to, to share the knowledge. So when you read the book, when you watch the film, don't keep the nuggets you learn to yourself, you know, share them because somebody else needs them out there. Yeah. And, you know, that's what Alzheimer's Speaks is all about is raising others' voices and sharing knowledge. And you too, if you're listening, probably have a story to, to share. So reach out to me at radio at Alzheimer Speaks. I'd love to talk to you. And again, Pat, thank you so much for your time. And My pleasure, um, Laura. This was great. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, this is a really important piece of the puzzle for people to see. And you did such a brilliant job at displaying it. It's going to take people back, but yet it's reality-based. You, it, The emotions are expressed. The actors did a, a fantastic job in the film with this. I mean, you can really... You can feel it, you know, as you're watching um, the the trauma, the fear, the anger, the hurt, um, the love. You know, you can you can feel it all throughout the movie. So good yeah. job. I'm always here if you need me, Laura, too, as well. Keep me involved. Okay, sounds like a plan. Thanks okay. so much, everybody, and Thank you for today. Uh, we will talk soon. Bye now. Okay.